back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we discussed the superficial layer of the anterior musculature of the forearm. So we've mentioned the brachioradialis, pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. These five muscles constitute the superficial layer. In this video, we're going to look at all the layers deep to this, but before we do that, I want to do a brief review of some of these muscles, just identifying them. We already looked at this picture, and you can certainly go back and look at the previous video to see that. We're going to switch pictures right here and look at a few other aspects, and actually this picture is flipped. So this picture that we just looked at, this was a left forearm. Remember the brachioradialis is on the lateral side because it's superficial to the radius, so thus the name. And then over on this side where we have flexor carpi ulnaris, that's the medial side. Notice in this picture, here's brachioradialis, the largest of these muscles in the superficial compartment. So in this picture, the lateral side's over here. And actually we can even see this thickening of the hand, that represents where the thumb is. In fact, if you look at your hand, you can actually see that the region uh, that's pretty much proximal to the thumb is the thickest part of your hand, at least at that level. So this is going to be the lateral side. And then over on this side, where we have flexor carpi ulnaris, this is going to be medial. Up here at the top, this is the biceps brachii muscle. Okay, We're only seeing the distal part of the muscle, so we can't see either head of the muscle. Remember, there's a short head, which is a medial, and a long head, which is lateral, but that's way up near the shoulder joint. Here's the common belly of the biceps brachii. And notice two things. One, we see here where my mouse is, the biceps brachii tendon. Okay, that tendon is going to insert on the radial tuberosity. However, we have this other broad tendon called the bicipital aponeurosis, which is actually going to wrap around and actually have an insertion on the ulna. We usually think of the biceps as only inserting on the radius, but due to this bicipital aponeurosis, which comes off and actually wraps around some of these superficial muscles right here, the forearm, it actually is going to have an insertion on the ulna as well, which actually helps uh, stabilize those two bones together when you're performing an exercise like a bicep curl or even tricep extensions. Okay, All right, so let's look at these muscles. Over on the lateral side here is the largest of these forearm muscles. This is brachioradialis. Remember that this muscle is going to be innervated by the radial nerve and it's going to participate in elbow flexion. If we look right here, coming right underneath the bicipital aponeurosis, here's our pronator teres muscle. Okay? Pronator teres can assist in elbow flexion, but remember this muscle is mainly for pronation of the radial ulnar joint, or we could say pronation of the forearm. We're going to see the synergist of this muscle, pronator quadratus, at the very end of this video. Then we've got flexor carpi radialis. This muscle is going to participate in both wrist flexion, so flexion of the wrist down here, and then also radial deviation of the wrist. Then we have palmaris longus which is going to participate only in wrist flexion because it has the middle insertion. Then we've got flexor carpi ulnaris, which is the most medial of all these muscles, which is going to also participate in wrist flexion, but also ulnar deviation of the wrist. And remember that pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, and palmaris longus, all three of these middle muscles are going to be innervated by the medial nerve, and then flexor carpi ulnaris is innervated by the ulnar nerve. Now right here we see a list of muscles. These are the superficial flexor muscles, and we talked about all four of these right here. Uh, brachioradialis is not considered part of that, generally, okay? but these four are. There's a fifth one down here that we did not talk about, which is sometimes grouped with the superficial flexor muscles as shown here. Sometimes it's given its own layer because it's a little bit deep to these muscles. Okay, That's called flexor digitorum superficialis. If we look at the position of this muscle, what we see is that it's a little bit deep, but that it lies basically between palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris. Okay? So this is flexor digitorum superficialis. Let's take a look at that muscle. If we peel away all the other muscles, this is actually what we would see. OK, 
Okay. Now, because this muscle is so close to flexor carpi ulnaris, it's going to exist more on the medial side. So in anatomical position, you can see it's a little bit closer to the pinky than it is the thumb. Now, the origin of this muscle is twofold. One, it's going to originate up here on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. That's one belly of the muscle. But actually, there's a second belly that's going to originate right here on the anterior border of the radius. It doesn't really look like there's two heads here, but there actually is. Here's the, the origin on the radius. Here's the origin up here on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And there's also a little bit of origin you can see here on the coronoid process of the ulna. Okay. Now, these two heads are going to converge into one big belly right here, and then those fibers are going to form a tendon, which sends an individual tendon to all four of the fingers except for the pollux, except for the thumb. So basically, digits two through five are all going to receive a tendon. Okay? And so the insertion of this muscle, all these tendons, is going to be the bodies of the middle phalanges of the medial four digits. Again, that means digits two, three, four, and five. Um, you can't really see it too well here, but the insertions are going to be here on the middle phalanges, not the proximal ones and not the distal ones. You can see this a little bit if we zoom in. What I want you to notice about these tendons is that if we look at one finger, here's digit two, we see that whenever the tendon crosses the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint, it actually diverges into two subtendons, I guess you could call it that. And so it creates this little space here uh, between the separation of the tendons. There's a reason for that, and we're actually going to see it on the next slide. But just bear in mind that we've got this space here from the separation of the tendon into two separate pieces per finger. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's flexor digitorum superficialis. Okay? It's also innervated by the median nerve, okay? just like some of these muscles from before, like flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and then even pronator teres. This muscle has several actions. One is to flex the middle phalanges of the medial four digits, also the proximal phalanges, and then also the hand, meaning the wrist. So because this muscle crosses the wrist and actually goes under the flexor retinaculum, that bundle of connective tissue that kind of holds all these muscles in place, it's able to, one, flex the wrist, but it's also able to uh, flex uh, some of these joints in the hand. For example, it's going to be able to flex that metacarpophalangeal joint right here. And then it's also going to be able to flex uh, the proximal interphalangeal joint. That's the joint between the proximal phalanx and the middle phalanx. Because this muscle does not insert anywhere on the distal phalanx, it's not going to be able to flex the distal interphalangeal joint, only the proximal interphalangeal joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, and then the wrist. Okay. So that's flexor digitorum superficialis. Okay. Um, if we peel off that muscle, that was sort of the intermediate layer, then we're going to get to the actual deep compartment of the forearm. So we have three muscles here, although some people would consider pronator quadratus a deeper layer since it's underneath these two. These two muscles are flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. Let's talk about flexor digitorum profundus first. This is actually going to be on the medial side, again, because it's on the pinky side. This muscle is very similar to flexor digitorum superficialis. Okay? Um, let's first talk about its origin. It originates up here on the proximal three quarters of the medial and anterior surface of the ulna, and then on the interosseous membrane. Okay? So it's going to originate on the ulna up here. And then remember, between the ulna uh, which is actually right here, and then the radius, which is the lateral bone, there's a bundle of connective tissue. That's the interosseous membrane that holds those two bones together. Well, part of the origin of this muscle is going to be on that interosseous membrane, so we can't actually see it. It's deep to it. Anyways, as the fibers go distally toward the wrist, we see, just like in the case of flexor digitorum superficialis, we actually see the muscle divide into separate tendons. And so again, we have tendons going to digits 2, 3, 4, and 5, but also not the thumb, just like in flexor digitorum superficialis. The difference is that the insertion here is actually going to be on the base of the distal phalanges. Remember that flexor digitorum superficialis did not 
insert on the distal phalanges. It inserted on the middle ones, okay? Flexor digitorum profundus inserts on the distal phalanges, okay? And so its actions are going to be very similar to flexor digitorum superficialis, but with one added function, okay? Uh, you're still gonna have the ability to flex the wrist because this crosses the wrist. You're going to be able to flex the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint. You're gonna be able to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint, but because the flexor digitorum profundus inserts on the distal phalanx of each of these fingers, it's also gonna be able to flex the distal interphalangeal joint. So all the interphalangeal joints, both of them, can be flexed by flexor digitorum profundus. Okay, so it gets that added function because it extends a little bit further to the distal phalanx. One other thing I wanted to mention structurally is if we look at the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis, notice again that when they cross the metacarpophalangeal joint, they split. Okay, I've actually drawn them in green up here. That's the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis. But when we look at the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus, notice that they're deep to the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis, but they sort of cross through that gap that's created in the tendons of the superficialis. Okay? And they extend a little bit further and insert on the distal phalanx. So again, superficialis, or flexor digitorum superficialis, inserts on the middle phalanx right here. And again, those tendons are split. That creates a gap for the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus to extend through that gap and insert further on the distal phalanges of all the digits two through five. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now the innervation of this muscle flexor digitorum profundus is dual. If we're looking at the medial part of this muscle, so the part down here uh, closest to the pinky side, that's the medial side, that has innervation via the ulnar nerve. If we look at the lateral part of this muscle, so this over here, closer to flexor pollicis longus, this one's going to be innervated by the median nerve. So hopefully that makes sense. It's dual innervation depending on how close you are to the medial edge of the muscle. The last two we're going to look at are pronator quadratus, which is the deepest of all these. We'll come back to this last. And flexor pollicis longus, which is in red here. So the second of the deep muscles is flexor pollicis longus. This muscle in originates right here on the anterior surface of the radius and also the inner osseous membrane, just like we saw in flexor digitorum profundus. Okay? But this one is going to originate on the radius. We follow the fibers. They're going to converge at one tendon right here, and the insertion is going to be at the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. If we think about the thumb, realize this is not the same muscle, but here's our thumb. So here, this uh, joint right here, this is the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. But remember that the thumb only has two phalanges, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. And so the joint between here is the interphalangeal joint. So because the flexor pollicis longus inserts on the distal phalanx, it's able to not only flex this metacarpophalangeal joint, it can also flex the one interphalangeal joint of the thumb. And remember that pollicis is a term referring to the thumb because the thumb is also called the pollux. Innervation of flexor pollicis longus is going to be through the anterior interosseous nerve, which branches from the median nerve. We're going to see this is the same innervation as pronator quadratus, which is the final muscle we're going to be looking at in this video. Here's pronator quadratus in green. It's the deepest of all the muscles in the anterior compartment. Its origin is going to be on the distal anterior surface of the ulna, and then its insertion is going to be on the distal anterior surface of the radius. So actually, this muscle is oriented a little bit differently. All the others that we've seen kind of move along the length of the forearm, meaning they're moving parallel to the radius and ulna. Pronator quadratus is running perpendicular. Okay, It's running perpendicular to all these muscles right here. So actually, if we look at this, where's the ulna? Well, the ulna should be medial. Okay, Ulna's going to be on the side with the pinky. Okay? Up here, side with the thumb, this is going to be where the radius is. Okay, Radius is lateral. So the origin is going to be right here. 
on the distal anterior surface of the ulna, the insertion is going to be up here on the distal anterior surface of the radius. This muscle is running perpendicular, and so its action is going to be radio-ulnar pronation. So this muscle is synergistic with pronator teres. Remember that pronator teres also does radio-ulnar pronation, and remember what pronation is. Uh, again, we looked at this in a previous video, but pronation is basically when the radius is going to rotate over a stationary ulna. Again, go back and watch this video if you need more help with this. But when you do pronation and supination, okay, the ulna does not move. The ulna is forced to be stationary because it's locked into place in the elbow joint. Remember the olecranon process of the ulna is locked in the olecranon fossa posteriorly on the humerus. The ulna can't really move, so the radius rotates over the stationary ulna. Well, here's your pronator quadratus. Remember that the origin is here on the ulna, the insertion is over here on the radius. And so if you pull this insertion toward the origin, you're pulling this part, the radius, kind of over the ulna, and you can actually see that radius rotate over that stationary ulna right here. That's pronation, and that's facilitated mainly by pronator quadratus, which is synergistic with pronator teres. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And then with pronator quadratus, again, it's going to be innervated by the anterior interosseous nerve, which is the branch of the medial nerve. All right, hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of all the muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm. Again, I had a previous video where we discussed the superficial layer. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're going to look at the posterior compartment of the arm or brachium.